great, great. Good morning. Welcome to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. Craig Mish, Davis Maddock. We're recapping week two of the fantasy football season. And what a crazy week it was as we're here with you every day, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern, helping you win your fantasy football league this season. And Davis, uh, some wild, wild finishes to some games uh, yesterday. Uh, three games in particular catching my eye. Of course, the game we're going to talk about a lot. Uh, Miami and Baltimore, no question the way that that ended. The New York Jets with an insane comeback uh, to end up winning their game. And then, uh, boy, I thought the Raiders had that thing wrapped up against the Arizona Cardinals, and the Cardinals found a way to win that in overtime. So it's been some uh, a fun, fun red zone watching and fun – well, actually not. I mean, I had the red zone. I had problems yesterday. Uh, but fun football watching, I would say, for sure. Yeah, Sunday ticket did go down yesterday. That was uh, that was how I was watching it originally. I had to switch over to the YouTube TV version of Red Zone, so that wasn't that great. The Arizona Cardinals have yet to run a play with the lead this season, so that's not particularly great for them, even though they are one and one. And uh, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, to my uh, research, became the first teammates ever in NFL history to each have over. 40 PPR points in the exact same game. If you uh, if you had Tua, Waddle, and Tyreek, uh, I- I'm going to go ahead and guess you probably won your fantasy football matchup yesterday. Definitely uh, needed those uh, three guys to win a million dollars playing daily fantasy football yesterday. Definitely. No no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah, I was the high point scorer again, second week in a row in my league. But I think this time around, I'm not going to get outscored by somebody who just went off for one week. Uh, we're having a great start to the fantasy season. Christian Kirk has just been unbelievable. Wow, start the season. All right, let's let's uh, let's get to our headlines here on the show. As Davis mentioned, boy, everyone is buzzing after that Dolphins performance yesterday. As Tua throws six touchdowns, Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill look like that combo, honestly, kind of like Kansas City does in a way, Davis, with your team for sure. They look fantastic on offense, not great on defense. Maybe that's going to be their season. Trey Lance will miss the rest of the season with a broken ankle, so enter Jimmy G once again. They were pretty dominant yesterday in their performance against Seattle. Arizona State fires Herm Edwards two games in or three games into the season after their home loss to Eastern Michigan. There's some video circulating. It looks like Edwards was told on the field after the game. And Aaron Judge chasing 61 hits home run number 58 and home run number 59. He's got just under three weeks to do it. The Yankees are going to have everything, it looks like, clinched up by the end of this week. So we'll see. I mean, I'm guessing until he gets 61, the Yankees are going to pretty much play him every day. But uh, we could start anywhere, Davis. I mean, I, I guess the Dolphins pretty much a good place to start. The offseason was interesting for them, of course, for a lot of different reasons. It looks like they were chasing Tom Brady. There were some, you know, it looks like they were chasing Deshaun Watson. Their owner gets suspended. Uh, you know, people are high on Tua. They're down on Tua. He's a very decisive talking point. And then yesterday puts a performance up for the ages in fantasy, six touchdowns. And and this coach they have, Mike McDaniel, is just like, I don't care. I'm just throwing it and throwing it as far as I can throw it. (laughs) Boy, 42 points in that comeback win. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that yesterday's performance with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell actually kind of proves the thesis behind why they spent the first round pick on Jalen Waddell and why they sent a first round pick out of the door to Tyreek Hill. I don't think anyone could seriously look at that game and be like Tua was on the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert level. You know, I mean, it's just like Tua, as as I've said on the show many times, incredibly accurate passer. But, uh, you know, it's, it's like I think I, I saw someone break it down this way. If you can't, as a quarterback, make the edge rusher who gets around his guy miss and then fire off a clean clean throw, you're a pocket passer. And Tua can't make that guy miss, right? He doesn't doesn't really have the awareness. He doesn't really have the agility. I think maybe as a result of that horrific hip, hip injury he suffered his final year at Alabama. But it didn't matter because when you're throwing to two guys who are as amazing, as fast, I mean, on some of these plays, it looks like Jalen Waddle literally has like suction cups. For hands. I mean, it is unbelievable how a, how he is able to reel some of these passes in. It doesn't matter if Tua is the 13th best quarterback in the NFL. If you're throwing it to two guys who are that good, I mean, it just, it just really doesn't matter. And so I think the, the front office looks vindicated. And by the way, 
everything I said in the preseason about Mike McDaniels. I was a little unsure. He talked a lot about running the ball. I'm all I'm gone. Done. He he knows the deal. Super aggressive throwing the ball once they get down. Uh, I I believe they've been the most aggressive team on fourth downs through two games in the NFL up until this point. Mike McDaniels, he totally gets it. He is a a great coach. Yeah, it looks fantastic. And, um, you know, and basically when the you-know-what hits the fan, McDaniel just says, you know what, that's it, out of the game plan, <laughs> time to throw to the guys. And uh, and I know Harbaugh Davis was real upset yesterday with his team saying it can't happen. I mean, I was watching that game very closely. Davis, there wasn't a Raven running at the end of that game after Waddle, after Edmonds, after Tyreek Hill. They were so tired because in the second half they just kept getting the ball and punting and that was that was part of it i mean i mean the ravens were gassed i mean i don't know what else to say they were absolutely gassed and i think that's kind of where you see the secondary effects of all these injuries they've had in the secondary because when you have four defensive backs injured that means you probably only have five defensive backs defensive backs love to rotate and they can't they couldn't rotate they just had to keep running after tyreek and waddle which uh, to me seems pretty freaking exhausting yeah, for sure. And uh, and you could probably say the same thing about the Jets at the end of their game, too, and their big win. Joe Flacco, uh, you know, sort of indicated at least for one week with his performance in the second half in their win as well. We'll get to our fantasy standout coming up next. Lots of Dolphins, lots of Jets, of course. And, uh, boy, the Lions playing great football, too. We'll be right back. Great, great. slightly conflicted is because I feel like I love so much on the board but do I love one thing more than another can I call one thing my favorite bet or my best bet we'll find out and there's just overall chaos is what it looks like with this offense on fourth down Jacoby Myers and Davian Harris running into each other but the Patriots getting bailed out by a PI down the field the morning after only on sports grid If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. It is really all about winning, but at the end of the day, if anyone tells you it's not about winning money, they're lying to you. Why do we DFS? Why do we play in these leagues? Why do we pay so much attention? It's because we want to win and we want to win the money. If you have some wide receivers that might have two or three weeks of tough quarter matchups ahead of them, don't just get all bent out of shape about these guys. In fact, go find them, target them in other leagues, and trade for them. Fantasy Sports Today, only on Sports Grid. Sports Press Rick Haro inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your daily numbers game. Well, Scott Frost was a hero in Nebraska, there's no doubt. He goes to Central Florida, undefeated season in 2017, bowl game a year before. He walks on water, returns home. Result, 5-22 and 22 in one possession games. If they waited till October 2, they could have saved 7 to $9 million, depending on how they did it in terms of relieving him of his responsibilities. Too much to take. Probably a booster. Who knows? The end of the day, interim coach Joseph takes over the team. They couldn't wait those two or three weeks. And here's the thing. Every coach now negotiates a significant buyout. That's the cost of doing business. The trade-off is some people think it's unfair at the back end. Maybe the only way to get the coach at the front end. Nebraska may be moving on to better things. Sports Professor Rick Haro, Daily Numbers Game. 
Welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today. If you won your Fantasy Football League, congratulations. Of course, there are two games on Monday Night Football tonight, so lots still probably up in the air. We'll have a preview of those games coming up in a little bit. So without further ado, let's roll through these standouts from Sundays and Sunday night's games in Fantasy Football. We'll start with Tua, of course, who threw for 469 passing yards. Also, six touchdown passes. Uh, did throw two interceptions in the first half, but... Monster game for him. Speaking of which, my gosh, Lamar Jackson, what a game for him yesterday. Set 119 yards on the ground, including a 79-yard touchdown, four touchdown passes, 318 yards. One of the best picks I made in fantasy this year was taking Lamar Jackson. He went, he went down way too far in fantasy drafts. This guy is going to get paid. Uh, Joe Flacco, I rip, I rip him a lot. I should give him credit for yesterday. But I hope this is the end for him with the Jets. Four touchdown passes, 307 yards as the Jets win. Carson Wentz, horrible first half, great second half in garbage time. 337 passing yards, three touchdowns, one interception. And Jared Goff taking advantage of the Washington defense. But I would say Davis, more of Detroit's offense, shockingly. Uh, you know, super aggressive. Dan Campbell has come in. And I don't know how many games they're going to win, but he has, has also done wonders for that offense since he's been there. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I love Jared Goff as a streamer in 12-team leagues. I mean, just getting to play with Amon Ross St. Brown, who I think is probably a top-five asset in Dynasty Fantasy Football, probably, you know, if we were drafting again today, would clearly be a first-round pick. Eight straight games with a target share north of 30%. Six straight games with a touchdown. Eight straight games with eight or more receptions. Just, if you can get him on your fantasy team, I would, uh, I would definitely do it. Lamar Jackson, again, according to my research, I believe that is the most fantasy points of any quarterback uh, of the last 10 years. I, I believe 49 mm. fantasy points in most scoring settings. You know, getting over 100 rushing yards uh, accumulates four total touchdowns. And and honestly, Carson Wentz looks terrible. Guy just, I just, almost no guy. I hate watching play football more than Carson Wentz, but you, he is clearly a fantasy starter right now, throwing to McLaurin, Dotson and uh and uh uh curtis samuel just i mean really and and they're going to be down in these games because the defense does not look very good i yeah. i started carson wentz over tom brady in a league yesterday and i'm, I'm probably going to continue to do stuff like that for the rest of the season with him all right fair enough if you uh drafted running backs in the first round of your fantasy football draft when are you going to learn your lesson my gosh this was just i know a desolate day for for running backs, uh, I believe the first 100-yard rusher of the day came at night on Sunday night in Aaron Jones. It's amazing. All right, let, let's go through the running backs here. There isn't a lot to love, honestly. Nick Chubb had 87 rushing yards, three receptions, 28 yards, and also scored. As I mentioned, it took till Sunday night to really get a standout performance. We got it from Aaron Jones. He rushed for 130 yards and two touchdowns. Tony Pollard, 43 on the ground, but made up for it with some PPR. Yes, it's sort of sad that we have uh, Eckler listed here after the Thursday night game because there wasn't much else. And then DeAndre Swift, who uh, clearly was a little banged up in this game, uh, and they played him, you know, limited. And, and he Williams, even I saw, still got some goal line carries. But Swift is going to be a monster, I think, in fantasy this year. But, yeah, I mean, that's the story, Davis. Like, I mean, what is there to say? If you get 10 points out of your running back, you're, like, jumping for joy at this point. It was not a good day for backs. It feels like it's uh, no good days for running backs. Nick Chubb with uh, with actually the third touchdown because, remember, he should have gone down at the end of that game against right. the New York Jets. Chubb should have done the Todd Gurley, the Maurice Jones-Drew, right? You're, you're about to be on the goal line. And Nick Chubb said, you know what? I, uh, I want my numbers. I want my touchdowns. And uh, it ended up leading to his team losing the game we love to see the Cleveland Browns lose. I think I think everyone can kind of enjoy watching the Cleveland Browns lose games after they were the villains of the NFL offseason. Aaron Jones with the massive game, hundred uh, over 100 rushing yards, two touchdowns. And, um, you know, Jones and Dylan are both going to be fantasy starters this year. I mean, mm -hmm. I certainly I, – I was not uh, discouraged by the 18 rushing attempts and two targets that A.J. Dylan got yesterday. But you're looking at this list and you're going – Matt, why did I not just draft wide receivers? Why didn't I just draft like seven wide receivers to start my draft and figure it out 
at every other position. Wide receivers are the kings of fantasy football now. We have entered into a new era in fantasy football, no doubt about it. Yeah, Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, not uh, pictured in our graphic today. All right, uh, wide receivers, we could go, you know, triple deep here with these guys because there was a lot of monster games yesterday. Uh, we'll start with Tyree Kill, who had 11 receptions, 190 yards. It's not a typo. He also had two touchdowns in the win over Baltimore. Jalen Waddle just as effective, 11 for 171 and two touchdowns. Amon Ross St. Brown was just wide open all game. Nine receptions, 116 yards, and, and two touchdowns. Cooper Cup, that's probably who should have been the first pick overall in fantasy drafts, not looking back on it. 11 catches, 108 yards, two touchdowns. This guy is unstoppable. And, uh, and Garrett Wilson had a breakout game. He had eight catches for 102 yards and two touchdowns. And honestly, we could keep on going. Like I mentioned Christian Kirk, he was great. He looks like a star in fantasy. There were some others, too, for me that, that ended up doing real well. And, and that just kind of drives the point home. You, you can draft three receivers with your first three picks and feel really good about it, I think, moving forward. I mean, how about, how about your – you, you could have theoretically started your draft, Cooper Cup, A.J. Brown, T. Higgins, Amon Ross St. Brown, Drake London, right? Would have been, would have been very easy to do at ADP. Would have, would have really been no sweat. And you would, have, you would have looked at your roster with those five guys and been like – I'll start Jeff Wilson Jr. I'll start JD McKissick. I'll start yep. whoever, you know, I'll start Damian Harris. It doesn't matter. I'll pick up Carson Wentz off the waiver wire. And tight ends, by the way, we're about to get there. That plays into it too. Tight end scoring through two games. I mean, it's like Cole Komet, a top 100 pick, zero receptions through two zero. games. Albert O, my guy, my guy, Albert O, zero yeah. receptions yesterday in that win for the Texans. Kyle Pitts has four catches through two games. You know, I mean, George Kittle has not played yet. Dalton Schultz gets banged up yesterday. TJ Hawkinson looks like an afterthought for the Lions. Like it is, I, I just, it is absolutely unbelievable through two weeks. Like if you do not have four good wide receivers, you are just not winning your fantasy football league this year. Yeah. The other tight end on Denver caught that touchdown. I was thinking of yeah. <laughs> Alberto was running right by him at that time. Uh, okay. Uh, well, you know what? If you took Andrews or Waller, you got your production yesterday. So let's give those guys credit because Andrews was great. Nine for 104 and a touchdown. Uh, Waller finally had a nice game. We've been waiting on this for like, it feels like eight months. Uh, he had uh, six receptions, 50 yards and a touchdown there. That's a lot of fantasy points for a tight end. Zach Ertz, I don't know what the Cardinals are doing. They really don't have a ton of targets. Um, Higby, seven for 71. Gusecki, 441 and a touchdown. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think you drove the point home there, Davis. It's like even the elite tight ends, you're just not sure what you're going to get on a week-to-week basis. But Andrews and Waller did come through for you. Andrews and Waller did come through, which is, I mean, that's pretty much why we drafted those guys ahead of some of these great wide receivers. Andrews in particular, I think you have to be feeling very good if you selected him because right there at the end, you know, after that 50-yard reception against the Jets in the preseason, Kyle Pitts kind of started to slide ahead of Mark Andrews in ADP. That is definitely looking like a mistake through two games. Darren Waller, I mean, you know, I think it would have been rational if you drafted Darren Waller to maybe be a little worried after week one when Devonte adams posted a 48 percent target share that fell way back to earth in that game against the cardinals i don't really have an explanation for how that happened i actually thought it was a little bit strange that adams scores the one yard touchdown and then they kind of just put him back on ice for the rest of the game and then you know Ertz also with all these wide receiver injuries hopkins suspended rondale injured you know they're counting on greg dorch out there and it makes sense that zach Ertz would get used kind of the same way he was used in Philadelphia, just very reliable, you know, catch it for seven yards and uh, and fall down. But the tight end position, I mean, I, I have a couple teams in the FFPC main event where we did not draft the tight end in the first four rounds. We didn't get any of these guys, and we got one catch amongst three tight ends. I mean, it is rough out there. Yeah, I know for sure. Yeah, I went in, I was in a league playing against Komet, and, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't see the whole game last night. I went back and looked this morning. I'm like, did he even play in the game? I mean, no targets for, I mean, Justin Fields with a guy like that. That's uh, shocking. Uh, all right, we'll take a quick break here on the show. Coming back next, Monday Night Football. We will keep up going here for you here on Fantasy Sports Today. Don't go away. Break, break. Your heart. 
starts racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best slips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. All that matters is getting first in these contests and uh, trying to not split that first place money with as many people as possible. So I've already had my, my brain working. Both across FanDuel, I'm going to have a lot of exposure. And if I'm not going to go with him in MVP, I'm not going to say I'm locking him in my flex plays, but it is going to be damn near close. I mean, I just think he's a fantastic play overall. Fantasy Sports Today, only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The, early, the top four seeds here in the Big Ten, they're going to play Aaron less Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game pass. time decisions. Right. This is a good Purdue football team. They lose George Karloff. In game live I all like access. Mandy. I like Mandy against Bam. I think Mandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live oh, prime yeah, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet can get in. the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid. They scored seven points in a football game <laughs> With two and did not score a touchdown. Let's think about that. You're not good at math. I'll do the math for you. For laying things off, but you're doing something wrong with this group or that group or whatever. I, I, Within one to two years, absolutely. And it could involve a referee of a major professional sport. There's no debate in my mind if that's possible. The Bostonian versus the book only on Sports Grid. Well, we are fortunate to have two games on Monday Night Football. We're going to preview those with our next guest, Andrew Erickson, of course, of Fantasy Pros. Joins us now here on the show, along with Davis, of course. We're going to go over some of the pricing tonight and help you potentially make some money. It's uh, great to have you back here, uh, Andrew, on the show. Uh, before we get into tonight, uh, any uh, quick takeaway from yesterday? Maybe something in the numbers that you found that is worth mentioning as we begin here. Well, I think it's interesting that, you know, whatever we saw happen in week one was not necessarily a lock to continue into week two. And it's a reason to not just look at what happened in one week as the sample size. And this was going to be it's going to happen every single week moving forward. You had with the Rams backfield, Cam Akers didn't play at all in week one. And in week two, what do you know? He leads the team in carries. The Texans backfield, Rex Burkhead, 19 touches in week one, two in week two mm -hmm. instead of Damian Pierce. So, it's okay to, you know, obviously react to what happens in week one, but to not go overboard and bury players after they don't perform or don't get the usage in week one because things can change in week two. So whenever you're not sure if it's a trend or not, it's always kind of a good bet to buy low on the talent of the particular player and hope that eventually the coaches realize what they're doing. Yep, I think that's fair for sure. All right, uh, so let's take a look at the quarterbacks, and then I want to ask both you guys uh, this question in addition to the quarterbacks how the dynamic of having two Monday night football uh, games changes the DFS, uh, you know, basically option going in. But here are the, here's the pricing of the, the main you know quarterbacks tonight that, 
you have to pick basically one of the four, uh, you know, with the two game slate. Josh Allen, 7,800 for the Bills. Hurts, 7,100. Uh, Cousins is 6,200, Andrew. And Ryan Tannehill is 5,200. So uh, let, let, let's go through the quarterbacks here. And then uh, you and Davis both talk to me how you feel about playing now with two games on Monday night. Yeah, I, I built kind of some some template lineups before coming on here just to get an idea of how you could fit things. And it's really, the pricing is pretty soft, at least when I kind of went in. You can kind of play whoever you want for the most part, especially with the quarterbacks. Like you didn't, I didn't feel the need, like I got to pay down to get Tannehill in so I can jam in a bunch of these stud players. Like it's not hard to get in Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts along with getting in some of their pass catchers. So you're going to have to make some sacrifices somewhere especially because I'm not necessarily in love with a ton of the higher price running backs necessarily on the slate. So I don't have any problem paying up for Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts because you have two quarterbacks that can add rushing, which Kirk Cousins and Ryan Tannehill don't necessarily bring to the table. I, I just think the, the ceilings with Hurts and Allen are so much farther ahead of the two pocket guys. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that analysis is correct. Hertz and Allen are projecting for like six, seven, eight more points than Tannehill and Cousins. The one thing I would say is that Cousins is likely to be less owned than the percentage chance that he outscores those guys. The, the version of the Vikings that we saw in week one were far more aggressive throwing the ball, far more aggressive throwing the ball on second downs. They went for it on fourth down a couple times. Like th This version, the, the, the Kevin O'Connell Vikings are not – the Mike Zimmer Vikings. So one of the one of the things I would note is Vikings prices are going to look, I think, quite different heading into week three and week four. I think we're going to see Kirk as like a $6,800 quarterback. Justin Jefferson is going to be $10,000 on DraftKings in pretty much no time. He's right up there with Cooper Cup and, uh, you know, the, the Devontae Adams and the, the best wide receivers in fantasy football. No, no doubt about that. All right, fair enough. Let's uh, move over now to the running backs. This is a dicey spot, of course, as we saw wasn't a great week for running backs in the NFL. Maybe that will change tonight as Dalvin Cook is priced at 8000 Derrick Henry just under that at 7800 And then you're rolling the dice here. You got Madison about 5600 Sanders 55 Singletary on Buffalo 53 And Andrew Kenneth Gainwell, if you want to take a shot, maybe with a goal line touchdown, 4500 tonight. Yeah, for me, I, I, I want to try to save some salary with one of these running backs here. And I like I like Devin Singletary. And it really goes back to, I think that he's going to get the volume in this Buffalo Bills back. But the last time we saw Singletary, it was a three-headed committee between Zach Moss, James Cook, and Devin Singletary. But the one thing Singletary didn't do in that game was fumble. The other two running backs fumbled. And last year, Devin Singletary started out the year as the lead back. And then he fumbled very early on in the season. And then you kind of saw the Bills go away from him during the first half of the season. They kind of flirted with other running backs. And then ultimately they decided to not use any running backs till the second half of the 2021 season when they really unleashed Devin Singletary. So I think just based on what the other running backs did when they got the opportunities, you know, Zach Moss catching six passes for basically no yardage, just looking like absolute dust with the ball in his hands. I think Singletary is going to be the bell cow back. And I think that he's going to be a value here at 5.3K that lets you pay up for some of these stud wide receivers that you want to get in your lineup. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. I think Singletary is one of the better leverage plays on the slate too. You know, obviously if Singletary scores twice, that means that Stephon Diggs is not scoring. Those are touchdowns that Josh Allen uh, is not scoring. You're, uh, you're also not going to hear me say this very often. In fact, probably never Craig on a main slate. Am I going to say this, but given the context of the slate, the Tennessee Titans are big dogs to the bills. Everyone wants to play Josh Allen. Everyone wants to play A.J. Brown, Justin Jefferson, Stephon Diggs. You know, there's really only one tight end who's, who's worth considering uh, in Dallas Goddard on this slate. Derrick Henry on a two-game slate is probably going to project for 20 to 25% ownership. And if I, you know, if you and I tomorrow morning, Craig, are saying, well, Derrick Henry did it again, 28 rushes, 137 yards, two touchdowns, we're not really going to be that surprised. So, again, you're, you're really not hearing me say this very often, but Henry is probably the best leverage play of the slate. All right. And uh, over at wide receiver, we do have one key player questionable for the game tonight. So we'll get to that here in a sec. But the players we know are in are Justin Jefferson at 9,000, Stephon Diggs at 7,500, A.J. Brown at seven. Adam Thielen is down to 5,300. That's as low as I can remember him price in a while. Devontae Smith is 4,500. Robert Woods, if you dare, Andrew, uh, 4,400. But naturally, some of Buffalo's ownership tonight is going to be based around the health of Gabriel Davis. Of course, he is questionable going into this game. 
And that raises, you know, a lot of other questions. Is Isaiah McKenzie a possibility to slide in? Uh, you know, maybe take a shot on Osborne on Minnesota instead of him if he was somebody you were considering in the slate tonight. I, I guess we're kind of going to have to wait and see this one because I haven't gotten a clear indication if he's playing or not. Yeah, we know that Gabriel Davis suffered a, an ankle injury, non-contact ankle injury in Saturday's practice. We'll see how he suits up. I mean, I'm assuming that'll be based on his limitations or they go through pregame warm-up. So if he ends up not playing, I think that McKenzie obviously is someone that you want to gravitate towards. But I think Jameson Crowder is also going to play a decent amount as well. So you have their prices pretty close to each other. I mean, Crowder was getting run even in week one while McKenzie was fully healthy. So if you see both those guys see their uptick in snaps, I think that Crowder, if he's going to be at half of the ownership of McKenzie, McKenzie didn't do much besides just catch the touchdown. And if that just happens to be Crowder that ends up catching the touchdown instead of Isaiah McKenzie, then you're going to benefit and have leverage over the field. And I also think Dawson Knox, I know we're not talking about tight ends quite yet, but people are kind of forgot about Dawson Knox. But if you take out a big red zone presence in Gabriel Davis out of the lineup, you know, that's what Dawson Knox did last year when he was actually productive. So if everyone's just going to play Dallas Goddard, then you just play Dawson Knox with a potentially limited Gabriel Davis. And people will just be, I think, thinking about, okay, who's the next wide receiver up when it could be really Dawson Knox that actually taking a bigger step in presence in the red zone. Yeah, I would, I would likely anticipate Knox playing the second most snaps, running the second most routes on the Bills tonight. One name to consider if you're playing in, you know, the millionaire maker tonight, these, these huge bill, definitely not for single entry, but Khalil Shakir guy out of Boise state, he actually played more snaps on the outside than in the slot during the preseason. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, all due respect to Jamison Crowder, uh, Jake Kumaro, and these guys. Like, the, those, we just know what those guys are. They have no real upside. The team is not finding a diamond in the rough. But Shakir was quite good in the preseason and a super productive player in his college career at Boise State. I wonder, uh, with Gabe Davis out tonight, if Shakir is actually the guy who, at minimum salary, you know, ends up going – four catches, 50 yards, and a touchdown. He's he's probably one of my favorite darts tonight in these contests. All right, and let's close it out with the wasteland of tight end, which no doubt that's the topic tonight. My gosh, this is going to be a tough one. I think Davis said last week that whoever picks the best tight end wins the money tonight. Maybe that's the case again tonight. Uh, Goddard, 4,700. Knox, 4,000. And then, I don't know, Irv Smith, 3,200. Hooper, 3,000. We literally have Jeff Swaim, Andrew, listed here. At 2,800 tonight. Any inkling on the tight end position? Well, Jeff Swain did out-target Austin Hooper in week one. So, I mean, if you're going to look at a punt tight end, I think maybe Swain would be the guy if you're just hoping that all the tight ends just don't do anything and you just benefit from having Swain as the cheapest guy that lets you jam in the other studs. Because, look, there's no elite tight ends on the slate. You know, Goddard is the closest thing to that. But you're basically just hoping whoever catches a touchdown. I think Irv Smith. You know, he had a very limited role in week one, but you have to kind of chalk that up to him just coming back from his injury, not playing for so long. So if he ends up taking on like that Tyler Higby role that we kind of projected him and forecasted him having in the off season, then you could see Earth Smith having a much bigger role, obviously a touchdown presence in that offense. But I think I'd probably just still like lean on Knox, especially if Gabriel Davis is out because everyone's just going to play Goddard. Yeah, I don't really care what Knox's projected ownership is. He, he just really is such a good play. I would say, if, again, trying to get fancy. Uh, Johnny Munt ran the third most routes on the Vikings last week. I would be shocked if that continued, like literally shocked. But, you know, we're trying to win a million dollars in these big fields. Like, you, you could probably play a little bit of him and see if he scores a touchdown. All right. Well, uh, Andrew, again, thank you again for coming on the show. Uh, really appreciate it. Obviously, uh, head on over to Fantasy Pros for the latest rankings, updates, and, of course, helping you win at fantasy football, both on the daily and season long side. We'll look forward to catching up with you again after week three. Thanks again for coming on the show. Awesome. Thanks guys. All right. Andrew Erickson with us along with Davis here on fantasy sports today. Coming up next is time for some fantasy or reality. And then the sports grid 60. And as a reminder, we're right back here on the show tomorrow. We'll have our fantasy standouts from four teams, two Monday night football games tonight, not starting at exactly the same time. It's a brand new day for Monday night football. They're trying to sort of create a red zone within two games on Monday night. Will that end up working? Well, you got to have two good games going on at the same time too, I would think. We'll have more coming up. Stay on the grid. Break, break.
Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College That's football the today. Alabama in winning SEC champion. It's the island of misfit toys. Fantasy sports so today. You have to understand that. $4 word. gap between them and Kansas City. Pro football them today. Years when this happened to this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injuries. This is a brutal rash of in injuries. Game line, but you can take all the points. Access. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In game go. live, prime time. I'm going a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international, Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. American at Georgia, man. Now he's done. Anyway, I like where you're going, Brancy. I love those cats. <laughs> Jaguars plus four and a half. Put it in. I endorse it. Robert Sala, you suck. Your team sucks. J E T S just end the season. Y'all need to come better. You know what? I'm giving the big dummy award to Robert Sala. Take my receipt, Robert. I want my money back. In game live, all access only on Sports Grid. The morning after. Aaron Rodgers is playing with a ton of new wide receivers this season and doesn't seem all that happy about it. Today we hit the streets of New York to help and find out what's the best way to make new friends. What would you say is the best way to make new friends? Uh, not by talking to them on the street. So not, don't do this. Go out and drink, go to the bar. You know, you have to. Maybe not like this. Give him money. Smile. That was nice. Want to give the smile again? The Sports Grid Network. Proved how much better they are than Texas. This actually matters. Winning this game 65 nothing matters because see they see because UL Monroe lost to Texas 52 to 10. Oh, you team is playing defense this year. I understand it's Kent State wow. and UTEP, but they're only allowing on average eight points per game. They held Kent State to just three points last week, Kevin. We talked about that total mm -hmm. on last week's show. College football today, only on Sports Grid. You might be the next daily fantasy millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Great, great. Before we get to some fantasy and reality, you know, Davis and I used to do this show for two hours last year. So we were able to go over all of the teams in fantasy, the studs and the duds. But Davis, uh, with our show now being an hour, we don't get a chance to do that. So uh, we went over the uh, most as many studs as we could. But I thought maybe we would throw a, a couple duds out there. Uh, I mean, the Denver Broncos, I'm not really even sure what it's to say at this point. I know a lot of this is going on the coaching. There's no question. But I got to be honest, I watch a lot of that game. I don't think Russell Wilson looks right either. I'm not sure what's going on there, but he does not look like the same guy as he was in Seattle. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. I understand the coaching is not good. And then the other one, obviously, and, and hopefully, hopefully this is the end for you with Jameis Winston. I don't know when it's going to come, Davis, but can you please come around here and understand that the Saints need a quarterback? Got to draft a quarterback next year. They should have just tanked this season to get a quarterback next year, but my goodness, did he look bad yesterday. Really, really rough. He did, uh, but I mean, for fantasy, uh, I actually think it's going to end up working out. 334 air yards for Chris Olave, 6 for 65 and a touchdown for Michael Thomas. No Alvin Kamara yesterday. They had Tony Jones out there for 35 of the 67 offensive snaps. Don't really know what, uh, what was going on there. But uh, also, Russell Wilson, you know, for fantasy specifically, this dude is not running at all. You know, it's it's gone. He has three rushes through two games. And, you know, again, if we're going to be fair, fair and balanced here, KJ Hamler missed that game. 
and Jerry Judy got injured in the first half. So, so when they're trying to win this game in the second half, he's got Sutton and then a bunch of dudes, you know, Tyree Cleveland, Eric, so like, just like practice squad guys, you know, cause mm-hmm. Tim Patrick got injured as well, but right. I, I am I am worried. I am worried about Hackett. I'm worried about Russ. I'm worried about uh, everyone on that team, but Sutton and Javante Williams. I think those guys will be fine. Everyone else, I'm I'm worried. I think you have to be for sure, so especially against a team like Houston. That you know, you know what they're playing for at this point too. All right, it is time for us to close us out with a little fantasy or reality. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Colts, throw them under the bus too. That was also really poor yesterday as well. I want to add them to the list. Uh, okay, so Aaron Judge hit two more home runs, and it looks like he's closing in on 61. He's only a couple away. I think he's going to get it before the end of the season for sure. He's also, you know, he has a chance, Davis, at, at winning the Triple Crown right now too. I know that he's still, you know, some percentage points away from the American League leader in that too. But let's just throw out some hypotheticals. Let's say he does get to 61, maybe gets to 62. Uh, fantasy reality, Davis, Aaron Judge, by hitting 62 or more home runs and winning the Triple Crown would be the greatest hitting season ever. Is that fantasy or reality? <sighs> greatest hitting season ever. I mean, I would have to, you know, really delve into the depths of, uh, you know, the the baseball reference annals. I my my instinct because of offensive environment and how good pitchers are now. But my instinct is actually it's probably pretty close. Um, you know, compare it to what you know Barry Bonds and McGuire and Sammy Sosa, all these guys were doing. Like it was a different era of pitching. And then can we really compare 2022 baseball to Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays? Like it's 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 honest to God, it's like they're playing a different sport. I, I mean, how hard did pitchers throw back then? You know, were were you ever seeing 102 mile an hour fastballs in 1960? I don't. Maybe you were. Uh, again, I I would have to be a little bit more studious of the game. I you, but it's just again. I still want to say Otani wins the MVP, so it's hard for me to say reality here. But I, I am gonna say I am gonna say reality. It just feels it feels like he is playing at the plate a different sport than everyone else. Yeah, I mean, it's it just are there asterisks involved? Like you have to ask yourself those questions with these two because you know the season. You know, Bonds hits seventy home runs. He walks two hundred fifty times. Davis, like I mean, there's just nothing that's ever gonna touch that sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, to, to, to win the triple crown, lead the league in home runs and hit as many home runs as he has, it's going to go up there as one of the best of all time, whether it's the very best, hard to say, Uh, you know, there were some incredible seasons also, I would say when players didn't work out and they were not built like Aaron judge in the eighties and the nineties. And let's also not forget, I mean, Davis, you had, even without a triple crown, you had players hitting 40 home runs and stealing 40 bases in the same season like let, that's a, a huge thing that's just gone away almost completely in baseball as well but uh you know for the sake of argument i'll say it's up there for sure the best of all maybe so uh, a light reality for me here uh on the show no doubt uh all right so uh two monday night football games tonight and there there are some that are out there that they love watching football all weekend long, but they're real excited to only have to watch one game on Monday night and one game on Sunday night. There are others who are like, all right, well, give me as many games as you can, as often as you can do it. And that definitely is going to be the case tonight as you have two games on Monday night and really good teams. Like of the four teams, three, you know, have a shot to win their conference, I would say, at the end of the season. So fantasy reality, Davis, the NFL should always have two games on Monday night football. No, I definitely, I definitely don't think this is true. And maybe this is just coming from my perspective as someone who, uh, you know, my, my job is pretty much fantasy football. I gotta be dialed into these games. If not, if not watching every snap, I at least have to be cognizant of who wins and who loses and what the relevant fantasy football performance are doing. It's a lot easier to do with one game, right? You can toss the game on, you can, you know, you can do the laundry, you can, you can uh, vacuum the living room, you can hang out with your dogs or whatever, like pretty, pretty hard to do. Like Craig, you know, when red zone is on, on Sunday, like I'm worthless, I'm not doing anything. I'm not helping out around the house. Nothing's getting done. I'm just watching football. And uh, yeah. And, and also it's just like a, it's a nice kind of end 
to the week, you know, start of the work week with the one game and, and you, you know, you transition over to everything on Tuesday. Like we, we don't need this. Remember when they played a game on Tuesday because of the COVID stuff, like just ruined everything. No one, no one. You remember the Wednesday game? Do you remember the Wednesday Packers Vikings game? Cause of the ice. I mean, one of the worst experiences of my life was the, was the Tuesday game. We don't need this Foot, football having three days a week is more than enough. I'm actually surprised to hear you say this too, to be honest. Uh, but yes, I mean, for somebody like myself, this is a no brainer. This is the easiest of all. I am firmly committed on Sunday from, a, you know, listen, it depends on my kids and things I have going on, but it's from approximately one o'clock Eastern, definitely till four o'clock Eastern. And then usually I take like a half hour break or whatever, and then pop in until eight o'clock Eastern. This is a huge commitment to have two more games on Monday night. The great thing about Monday night football is that if the game is great, you're going to know you're on social media. All of a sudden it's like second quarter. Oh, this is a great game. You know, you got to turn it in. You know what? The other great thing is a game like last night where, you know, you just, you I'm done. I do not need to watch that game last night. Whatever happens, happens. I'm out fine. I know the NFL doesn't want to hear that. They want me to be watching from the beginning to the end, but there is no possible way that I want to commit to more games on a Monday Night Football. So I'm with you. Fantasy for me. Every once in a while, cool, no problem tonight. Yeah, I can dig it, but not every single week, no. Just end it for me on Sunday. If Monday's great, pop it on. If it's not, halfway through, I'm out and on to the next day, especially with the baseball postseason starting. All right, uh, Mike Isecki, who was the subject of a lot of trade rumors, in the offseason for the Miami Dolphins. And honestly, with all of the fun that the Dolphins have had at the start of their season, really hadn't been that much a part of it uh, until yesterday where he ended up uh, scoring a touchdown. Jumped really high, by the way, back in the end zone. Uh, came down with the ball and uh, won a, a huge touchdown for them in that comeback win against the Baltimore Ravens. And then, uh, you, as you could see with sort of his touchdown celebration, it looked like he did what was called the gritty yesterday. Now, Davis, you'll have to get people familiar with this also before we take a step further because people may not know what we're talking about here. So fantasy reality, Mike Kosicki yesterday did the gritty. Yes, he did. Uh, and he did it in the, the loosest definition. Uh, so, Craig, this is like a, a pretty popular, pretty popular dance. Uh, Justin Jefferson sort of popularized it for uh, NFL celebrations. He does the best one. This is the dance that Adam Schefter was doing uh, on the field last season when he injured, I, I believe it was, his MCL. So I got I got reality. He did it, but he only did it because that was like sort of like you could tell he was doing it, but he certainly did not did not do it very well. Great, great touchdown reception by him, though. Yeah, I mean, it's like an eight foot touchdown. It looked like yesterday. So after the game was over, Gusecki said that he did do it, so this is a reality, that he did do it, but he also said that it looked a lot better in the mirror than it did yesterday on the field. So apparently he was practicing for this. So this is definitely a reality. He definitely did it. But in the end, David said, and he's 100% right, the, the touchdown catch looked a lot better than the celebration at the end of the game. But I would add, Davis, as we close it out here on this segment, I don't know what we could have asked for for the first two weeks of the NFL season. And you know me, you know, I, baseball is what I do all the time. But if you can't wrap your arms around what we've seen in the first two weeks, we, we could have gotten complete crap the first two weeks. You never know. And, and this week could be it. In fact, they, they could have all looked like Sunday night's games. But the comebacks in these games and the way that they are going down to the wire, I just kept thinking to myself, my goodness, it is so great to have this back, right? Like that's, that was exactly what I was thinking yesterday watching these games. Yeah. And uh, look, I mean, we got some pretty bad games in week one. I think, uh, you know, one of the things we, we definitely have learned is that these teams that don't play their starters in preseason at all do kind of start their seasons a little bit slower. I mean, Funnily enough, the Cincinnati Bengals, who have looked god-awful mm. through two games yeah. this year, they also looked pretty bad to start the season last year. The, the Bengals did not play any of their guys in the preseason. They're trying to figure out their offensive line. Joe Burrow, you know, last season was coming back from the ACL this season. Who knows? Um, and, we, you know, we've gotten some good – upsets you know no one no one had the the cowboys winning that game no one had a tie between the indianapolis colts and the texans in week one um you know but uh yeah football football has been fantastic it's it's amazing to have it back of course you you do look at a lot of your fantasy football teams and you're like it was so obvious that amon ross st brown was going to be this year's cooper cup like what are we doing and 
which is it's it's kind of fun, you know. It's fun to do the post mortem of some of the things you got right and you got wrong. But the NFL, I do. I think I think we're pretty lucky that the games have been so good thus far. Yeah, they they definitely have been. You're right. The late slate uh, last week in particular wasn't very good, and, and you know, be honest, this late slate wasn't fantastic either. But you know, in the end, as crazy as the Raiders, I'm sorry, as crazy as the the Ravens Dolphins was, and as crazy as Cleveland. Uh, was it the Jets? I got to tell you, I, I thought the Raiders won that game, man, like several times. Like, I, I mean, the Ra- you could sense the Dolphins had some momentum. Maybe they'll win. You could sense the Jets were building some momentum. I never felt like Arizona was going to win that game until it ended like that in overtime. That was the one. No, I mean, I thought I was sitting there like, uh, you know, when is uh, when is Cliff Kingsbury's number going to get called? Oh. Like, you know, when, when is he going to have to go talk? You know, when is he going to have to go to the principal's office? I am... I am absolutely shocked uh, by the Arizona Cardinals. Like, I, I think it is my, – my, the, the worst sin you can commit as an NFL head coach is have a very good quarterback and make his job harder. And it seems like Cliff is making Kyler's job harder. Yeah, I, I don't I, – as, as much as, as they added Hollywood Brown and I guess they'll wait on Hopkins, uh, that's another team I'm really worried about that they need to go back at it again, get an A.J. Brown, get somebody else really, uh, you know, at the end of the season. I, I, I guess it doesn't have – uh, enough weapons, but man, he played great at the end of that game. Kyler Murray. I was texting my brother. I'm like, "What the heck, Kyler Murray? Like, maybe we should go play baseball." My God, he's playing terrible. But yeah, he came back and won that game. The Raiders got to be stunned today after losing that one. All right, coming up next is time for the Sports Grid 60, and then Kevin and Donnie with the early line. I'm back with you at two o'clock Eastern for Newswire. So stay on the grid. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away. Break, break. Great time to get in on Chargers futures, just as an example, because we are going to see some huge, huge swings in those markets, uh, like way bigger than I think we've ever seen in the past. You look at lower salary running backs on FanDuel, they tend to pay off even when they're chalky. Uh, Their hit rate is very good. If you look at value, they're good, but also just like raw points, lower salary backs the public has confidence in tend to do very well. Fantasy Sports Today, only on SportsGrid. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College National football today. In Alabama and winning SEC championships. It's the island of misfit choice. Fantasy sports so, today. You have to understand that. $4 first. gap between them and Kansas City. Pro football them today. Years when this happened to this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injuries. This is a brutal rash. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In game live, prime time. I'm a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international, Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. The level of suckness goes here, Scott, on the suckness scale. Um, Hawaii is not going to suck as bad as Duquesne is. I love my Canes, and they hate me in Tallahassee, obviously. But I wanted to say that last night was the first time in 20 years that I bet on Florida State in a football game. I won't even let my kid go look at the school. In-game live all access only on SportsGrid. You might be the next daily fantasy millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. A Rod, Clemens, Pettit, Bonds, McGuire, Sosa, get ready because that soup is served ice cold. From a betting perspective for the 2022 NFL season, 
If I'm betting on the 49ers in the futures market, I want Jimmy G on this roster because that instantly becomes one of the best backups he's taken to the Niners to the Super Bowl. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on SportsGrid. While we were live on the show, Buccaneers running back Leonard Fournette sends out a tweet this morning apologizing to his fantasy owners that he did not score a touchdown, but says, don't worry, my touchdowns are coming. Here's Davis. Here's his Sports Grid 60. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers yesterday, every offensive snap, I mean, it just looked like these guys were trying to move, you know, 500-pound barbells or something. Like, getting three yards on offense. I'm watching Tom Brady throw to guys whose numbers start with four. Don't don't think Tom Brady has ever targeted a number 41 before in his career. Mike Evans gets ejected. Like, what is Tom Brady doing here? You know, his wife clearly doesn't want him to play. He's not practicing on Wednesdays, right? He's just taking Wednesdays off. Like, if I'm Tom Brady and I'm looking around the room, I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, they're just it, everything about this Buccaneers, the eight quarters they've played so far, it has just looked like uh, a lot of effort. I am, I am worried about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I think the only reason to feel bullish on them is that the NFC has no good teams, basically. Yeah, it, it almost feels like the Bucs will sleepwalk through the entire regular season and hope they could catch lightning in the playoffs because they, they have not looked great. Speaking of which, we talked a lot of positives. Here's one negative, and Davis mentioned it earlier. Uh, 13 sacks for Joe Burrow? Are you kidding me? After getting to the Super Bowl, there is this narrative that the team that loses the Super Bowl always comes out of the gate slow the following year. Boy, that has definitely been the case with the Cincinnati Bengals. They're 0-2, and they can't protect Burrow? What exactly did this team do in the offseason? I guess they threw a bunch of money at some offensive linemen that isn't working, but they got to get this thing fixed really quick because Burrow cannot go down like Andrew Luck. We don't want to see that happen with him. Guy is an incredible quarterback, and the Bengals have to get this fixed immediately. That'll do it for our show today. Thanks, of course, to our friends at LTN and our great graphics department. For our producer, Brett Levy, my co-host, Davis Maddock, I'm Craig Mish. The early line is on next for two hours, and then I'm back with you here on Newswire at 2 o'clock Eastern. We'll be back on the show tomorrow recapping Monday Night Football and also the waiver wire and injuries. Have a great day, everyone. Great, great.